Hey everyone, it's that time of year again. Welcome to session 211 of Behavioral Observations. If you're new to the show, every year I get together with my friends from ABA Inside Track for a year in review show. And 2022 was no different. In this podcast, we went over a handful of happenings in the world of applied behavior analysis, including the following. We talked about the changes in editorship and the changes in leadership at APBA and the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis. We talked about specific shows from both of our podcasts that resonated with our audiences. We took some fun questions from the audience, uh, like uh, whether West Coast or New England IPAs are, you know, which one's the best? I mean, come on, is that even worth talking about? Um, because the answer is obvious. Anyway, uh, yeah, so, and uh, I, I went into a very brief history of the American craft beer scene as well. I apologize for people who have no interest in that. Uh, we, we took some other great questions from the audience as well. As we've done in previous Year in Review podcasts, we talked about the passing of our uh, fellow behavior analysts, and this year we talked about the passings of Beth Salzer Azaroff, uh, David Yarmulitz, Tamika Meadows, and Dale Brethauer. I, I want to take a minute here and just just be pretty candid with you. I, I uh, this is a we we were kind of pressed for time with regard to not just the recording of this particular podcast, but also in the preparation of it. And um, I r regret the the I guess the brief mentions we made of these uh, individuals, uh, and certainly the oversight of people that we we didn't mention as well. It's always difficult when you're trying to discuss these sorts of things, and what we don't want to do is leave anyone out. Um, and certainly we could probably have multiple podcasts just on the contributions of these four individuals. Uh, and it was just one of those things in terms of being pressed for time. Uh, we did not, uh, you know, give these folks the attention I think they deserve. So I apologize for that. And uh, we will certainly uh, try to attend to that more closely the next year interview podcast. We also fielded a really great question from longtime listener Penny Holloway, uh, and it talked about the gist of the conversation is, you know, the, the, how the field may or may not be changing as it relates to a lot of the themes that we saw come up over and over again, both in 2022 and certainly uh, before that as well. Um, time, again, did not allow us to do her question justice. Uh, but if you listen to the very end of the show, I do my best to address it, and I hope you get a chance to check that out. Um, I uh, and it, it, it's a it's a question we should probably return to at some point or another. Um, so Penny, thank you for sending that uh, really thoughtful thoughtful question in for us to to kick around. So uh, I could go on and on, but I'm just gonna get to the show right away. Uh, huge thanks to my friends at ABA Inside Track for doing this, uh, along with uh, Alan Haberman, who joined us. They were great conversational partners, and I look forward to sharing more fun discussions with you in 2023 and beyond. So Happy New Year uh, from, from me to you. Um, before we get to this conversation, I do want to let you know that if you are looking to make a change in 2023, in terms of employment, whether you're looking for a new job, whether you're moving, whether you're graduating, you're going to want to go to hricolorado.com and schedule a confidential conversation with Barbara Voss. She's been in the recruiting business for over 30 years. She knows our field like the back of her hand. She knows all the job trends. Um, you know, so if you are looking for any information about placement and things along those lines, or if you're a company, and like everyone else, you're looking for staff. Uh, yeah, give give Barb a call. Uh, go to hricolorado.com. Uh, go through the contact page. Set up a call with her, and uh, she'll get you pointed in the right direction. Um, I also want to let you know that we are brought to you by the University of Cincinnati Online. Um, they created a, a, an ABA, a Master's in Applied Behavior Analysis program that's 100% online and asynchronous which means you can learn when it works for you. So uh, you've heard me talk about them before. Check out the show notes for this episode and just click the link to get more information there. And um, uh, last but not least, if you are looking for CEUs, I don't really talk about it too, too frequently on the show, but uh, the behavioral observations itself, we, we are purveyors of 
continuing education events as along with making podcasts. So if you want to learn from some of your favorite podcast guests, go to behavioralobservations.com forward slash get CEUs. And uh, what you'll also find there is there's lots of discounts. So if you need to pick pick up a handful of CEUs, um, you can uh, save a lot. So uh, all while doing other things like, uh, you know, walking on the treadmill, uh, doing the dishes, driving, et cetera, et cetera. So you can, you can get your continuing education while multitasking. So what's not to like about that? So just go to behavioralobservations.com forward slash get CEUs and go from there. All right, that's it for opening remarks. So I hope you enjoy this fun year in review podcast with my friends from ABA Inside Track. Welcome to the Behavioral Observations Podcast, stimulating talk for today's behavior analysts. Now, here's your host, Matt Sicoria. Welcome to the Year in Review 2022 with your friends. Your friends, here are your friends talking about behavior analysis, your favorite behavior analytic podcast friends. They're all here. We've got myself, Robert Perry Cruz. And me, Jackie, because it's still 2022. <laughs> and it's me, Diana. And you guys are stuck with me also, Matt Sicoria. Yes. yes. <laughs> That's why I said all of the behavior analytic podcasts, but I think oh, there's some other ones too. We'll, we'll oh, there's them plenty. Something. There's plenty. There's yeah. lots of good the ones OGs. out there. So the OGs are rocking the house. Yes. Not the original, not all of them though. No, that's true. We're we're the lo- we're the longest running ones. I think I think whenever it starts getting into Should like, we, you know, the multi-year club, maybe we'll yeah. we'll bring them in. Oh, and Should we've got we another guest. Say where what we are podcasts we're representing here. No, I'm I'm sure that everyone just decided to download this one. Like, what could this be? I don't even know. <laughs> just this random end of car. year. Randomly. <laughs> I've never Random heard of paper selection. analysis, but I you know, the end of year one is the best one. Oh, and we have another we have another behavior anal- analysis podcast friend. Who else is here? Alan Haberman, book club guy. Book club guy, yay! Hey, Alan. He's a book club guy. So yes, so yeah. I guess we should tell people if they're like, this is the first episode I've ever heard of either ABA Inside yeah. Track or Behavioral Observations. And I thought the end of year 2020 review would be the best place to start. But this is our fourth, fifth. I can't remember how many years. At least fourth year. We think we've done this to end and wrap fifth. up. I don't know. I'd have to, I, you know, fifth. I meant to look and I totally, yeah. I totally spaced on it. <laughs> Information we could have found and chose not to find. <laughs> <That's right>. uh, <laughs> Other things filled the void. Mm-hmm. Very true. Yes. But this is our, our wrap up of behavior analysis in the year where we're sort of talk about a couple things that happened this year and then do a couple questions. We had some listeners to the to the shows send in things, some questions they wanted to ask us. So we'll discuss those and just kind of a quick way to end the year for all the listeners out there of 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 the shows, because we've both been doing that. How long? I don't even know how long we were, we were all getting into six, uh, six and a half years. Yeah. Six yeah. And a half years. We'll, yeah. Well. Uh, I'll roll seven years in February. And then we're, yeah, I think we're a little after in in like March. Like, literally, it's shocking. That's right. I got I got a couple of weeks on you guys. But, yeah, I know. You know. I but, but who's I, really counting, right? You know, no, like, I can't believe that that happened. Though. Like, what are the odds? You that? guys, like Matt, you're the only one who brings that up. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up, Matt. <laughs> Just kidding. Yes, but we've been doing this a long, long time. We've been doing this a number of years now. So let's kind of get into what's going on with the year of 2022. If I remember correctly, 2021 when we did this, everyone was tired, and I think we talked about. Nothing of import and just shot the breeze for an hour or so. Yeah, we and drank booze. I, that's exactly what happened. Yeah. We drank booze and we were all tired. Yeah, that sounds what like 2021. Year. I don't yeah, know. 2022. Do we, do we feel more do we feel more motivated with like like related to the field questions and everything? I, yeah, I think we got a good agenda to, to to go through. And I know we were on a limited amount of time, and that might make our I guess run through of these topics more spirited, perhaps. So yeah, I'm, I'm excited to get into it. Beautiful. I'm certainly less tired than last year. Great. That's good. I remember, I don't remember being tired so much as just sort of like energy drained, I think was the big thing. Last year we did this. Let's do it. All right. I smartly, remembering we were going to do this because it's been four or five years of doing this, started noting a few things that did happen this year. And unfortunately, some of them were very sad. And then some of them were just sort of, oh, 
these are things that happened this year. So I guess we'll start with the, the, the sad was just the passings, which we've tried to do every year is to share some passings. I think one of the bigger ones was Beth Selzer Azaroff passed away in February of 2022. So almost a year ago now, she was 92. I hope I live till 92. It's not the worst age to be. That's a good run. Yeah. yeah, yeah. A, I'm like impressed. Yeah. People impressive. are like 90. I, I could go for 100, but I would settle with 92. Yeah. But she is one of kind of like the, the earlier, like pioneer female behavior analysts. She wrote a lot of books on education, some OBM. There was a physics book that her hus- her second husband wrote, apparently called uh, Physics Over Easy. Breakfast was Beth and Physics. So apparently she had a book written about her discussions of physics with her with her husband. That's sure. awesome. I know, not related to behavior analysis, but when I was just sort of looking into, into it a little bit, yeah. So, and there was a nice eulogy by Andy Bondi in uh, operants. I think it must have been like the the summer or, or fall operants or something. It was a, a very nice eulogy for her. Oh, and know, good, I missed that one. I'll have to go dig that up. I think it was in there. I could have sworn it was operants, and then I could not find the issue, and my link had died. So I couldn't find where I'd saved that one, but I believe that's where I saw it originally. I'm, I'm sure someone will send it to us. <laughs> you skipped part of your line here, which I think is important to note that Beth. Solzer Azarov was the first female president of ABAI oh, yes. and was also a co-founder of Babbitt. So for those of us here in New England, that's our, you know, tried and true behavior analytic conference. And I just think it's nice to note early female behavior analysts because there weren't very many that dated back to this time period in which she was doing her early work. And it was a real boys club out there. So it's nice to see strong female role models in the field. I mean, and this one, this one was not a name I, I knew too well, but I think I, I was at a webinar and someone mentioned Dale Brethauer, who was a, na- a bigger name in, in the OBM field, done lots of systems, or worked on systems, written some, some you know, OBM related papers, sort of well regarded to this day had passed away. But again, I'm not an OBM person. I just had noted it from someone who was big into OBM. So it seemed worth mentioning. Uh, so OBM folk out there, you may know this name more. And then... Yeah, you know, a little bit closer to home, Tamika Meadows had passed away. And, and we just recorded a preview episode that's coming out next week where we went into a little bit more more depth as to who Tamika was. But she was a very prominent blogger, very big proponent and speaker of ABA. She was all set to speak, at, as I think is like the, the, the... She was an invited speaker. Invited speaker at, at BABA this year. And it was very, it was very sudden. Next year. Next year. In June, but we were very sad to to hear about that. Were both of you had, had you got a chance to meet Tamika? I'm I'm not. I know she knew a lot of folks, but no, no, I didn't have the pleasure, unfortunately. Yeah, but uh, just, very just through this podcast and others that I'd you know heard her and some of her other content. So it was it was it was unfortunate, unfortunate passing. But you know, at least we have a lot. Uh, she was a great proponent for the field of behavior analysis. So, uh, and her work is still out there, you know, in terms of her blog or I love ABA blog. So people can definitely check that out and see what a amazing person she was. The only other kind of factoid things, there were some changings of the guard for folks who are always up on who's the editor in chief of Java. We had, Oh, that's what I was looking up. We had yeah. another one. Sorry, Diana, late breaking, not late breaking to not, the world. Not that I just had one other that I wanted to add here. So David Jamolowitz, Passed away oh, earlier right. this yeah. year, and he was relatively young and also well known and well respected researcher in our field. He worked at WVU, and a lot of people were really saddened and, and surprised by his passing. So we wanted to note that as well. Mm-hmm. So again, like some changing of the guard. You've been keeping up with, you know, who's the editor of your favorite journals? You know, probably Java in our field, right? Uh, Linda LeBlanc is her time as the editor of Java is, is coming to a close, and John Barrero is going to be taking. Over. I love John Barrero. Oh, I have a super best, yeah. I have a super crush on him. So if he's listening, he'll just know that every time I say it, I'm, he's like, hey, and I'm like, oh my God, you're so good. So if you're at your next Java issues, if you when you see him in person at a conference, you're like, could you sign all of these so for me? Job. With like hearts and kisses all around the, the really, I just think he's really nice. He looks he just looks really friendly. I like want to be his friend. I don't have like okay. a, you know, like a ooh, romantic crush, but I have like mm. a fangirl crush. Professional, Pro- professional crush. admiration. Yeah. You know, I, I had a chance to have lunch with him at ABAI in Boston. And, you know, everyone who I asked about him prior to that was like, oh, he's the nicest dude in the world. And, you know, I mean, people 
I think are inclined to be charitable and say nice things about colleagues and whatnot. And so and not that I, I wasn't skeptical of those observations. <laughs> You're like, oh yeah, was, right. John Brayer is not nice. No, he's a jerk. No, he's, <laughs> it just turned out to be really true. It's like the first time I went to Chicago and I was like, wow, it's really windy. It actually is windy. Here. <laughs> it's the same thing. It's like, man, this, this is the nicest dude in the world. We had a, we had a, uh, a lovely conversation and we're going to continue doing the inside uh, Java series podcast nice. uh, with him at the helm as nice. editor in chief. And so I am very much looking forward to that. Matt, yeah. if cool. you have lunch with John Brera again, I will not be sad if you invite me. Okay. Do you know it? <laughs> just putting it out there. I'll be like, oh. Not subtle. No, he, not he is, subtle. He's just, he's just, he's just a gem for sure. He's just a super nice guy. Uh, well, we'll see. We'll see what comes of that. I, you know, I, I know. I, I think this is probably the first time I, I mostly noted it because I saw Linda LeBlanc doing it like a, a she was talking and then mentioned it. it was the only reason I noted it. But I'm trying to think like what, you know, I think this might be the first time I, I really noticed, like, was there a change in Java content with Linda LeBlanc jumping on? And I maybe I guess there was some. But again, how much of it is because. It is, is it's just the changing you know, of the field. Like that's what it's going to be. The variable. Uh, yeah. I, I would say I would make two quick observations. One is Linda, I think her contribution, her, the editorship is that the big idea paper. So she, her challenge was for people to write more expansive papers that are more discussion and, and con mm -hmm. based, conceptually based, taking risks, and, if you will. I don't want to put words in her mouth, but that's the general idea. Mm -hmm. And it's not that there weren't these types of papers before, but you know, she made an emphasis in her editorship to encourage people to submit papers of, of that variety. And so there were a lot of good ones as a result of that, for sure. So uh, I, I think that would be one thing. I think another thing uh, of note, and I think this will only be meaningful to people who are print subscribers to Java. But over the last five years, I think the th the the actual thickness of the issues has almost tripled, if not quadrupled yeah. in, uh, okay. in, in width. And I, I want I want to say there's like a secret deal with bookshelf companies or something like that, you know, because I'm like these these things are stacking up in, in weird places because I don't have room on my bookshelf. You're gonna be that it's hoarder what, guy when you die. I people am, are gonna I come am, in and they're I gonna know. be like sitting on your Java stacks. Well, we, we found we found my, my mother's basement flooded a few years ago. We found all these old journals and she had like Jabba's from like 68. And she must have had like probably 10 years of Jabba, like in, you know, one of those sort of like rectangular Tupperware kind of big, big containers. Right. And yeah, I think if you tried to put 10 years of the Linda LeBlanc edited size one, <laughs> like you would need to get one of those like industrial, like a crate perhaps to get them all in there. Yeah, you need they, like a Rubbermaid, you know, tub of some sort. Yeah, it's a lot. Really, to what extent? I, I mean, I think that started happening under uh, Greg Hanley. At least tenure because he was, I believe he was the editor in chief prior to that. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think, I think it was trending in a, in a, in a bigger direction. But yeah, they, they got to be like two inches thick. Oh, it's man. super big. They're Ron gets big. the print one. Oh, yeah. looky here. I just happened to have one. This is, uh, <laughs> this is winter 2022. That's not even um, the biggest one, though. I mean, no, I, no, I, I feel one, like that one's one like one of the like smaller sizes. Yeah, this one. is a this is a slim version of it, and it's yeah. it's at least an inch thick. So you know, I see a journal that big. You know, I throw it back these days. It's not big enough. You know, I want I want even bigger. Okay. <laughs> There's laws about having journals that little. Yeah. Right? <laughs> well, thank you for bringing that up because I, I was I I thought it's like Matt's going to have two like really salient points about Linda in the journal, but I better I'm going to keep it in the pocket as the joke third one, and they got really big too. But thank you for. For <laughs> I had your back though, no matter. I beat what. you too, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then finally, I think in terms of like what some some changes before we get to some more like thematic changes. Uh, Tyra Sellers is now the president of APBA because Gina Green retired. She got a ukulele. <laughs> I love. Uh, did she retire then got a ukulele? Or she started playing the that ukulele and said, "I don't have time for both." Oh, I just when I saw that, I was like, "Oh, Gina, I want to come to your ukulele That's show." So nice. She's gonna, get, she's gonna have a YouTube channel, right? <laughs> That'd be awesome. Gina and the Yuki. I know. That's what's Let's work out that title for Gina first, shall we? I'll tell her. I already told her. Okay. I texted yeah. her. Congratulations, Gina. If you're listening to this, well she deserved. Needs it. So, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, yeah, so many, so yeah. many accomplishments. Congrats. Too, too many to list Absolutely. here. We'd be here all day. Yeah. yeah. Trying to list out the achievements that she's made in the field, APBA, and, and much beyond that as well. So, so yeah. we, And congrats to Tyra Sellers. Yeah. Yes. That is yes. a, a big job, and I have no doubt that she will be Very fantastic in that role. And, yeah, uh, yeah well-suited to it, for sure. Yeah. I can only say that we had her on last December, 
Tyra. Yeah. And yeah. she was talking about the new things that were happening. She didn't tell us. She's like, but yeah. there are new things in our life. And I'm always like, what are more of them? But she didn't tell us. Yes. And then, mm. so I'm wondering right. if this was percolating or if it was it, just yes, like definitely. a consulting job. But Dina heard what the gift was when she finally retired and was like, well, I'm going to speed that up. Yeah. Yeah. I got to get that you. Okay, yeah, yeah. But then when I found that out, when I saw it on the intranets, on the World Wide Webs. I don't I think people like, say that anymore. You know what? Doesn't matter. <laughs> I'm going to bring it back. I was like, oh, maybe that was it. Because I have still mm-hmm. been thinking about oh, me it. Too. Oh, me too. Me too. Yep. Yep. Because <laughs> I'm nosy as all get out. Those, those are fun. It's fun to hear about things like that. I mean, yeah. It's kind of fun to hear those changes. And- In our work, when you retire, they give you a lamp. Which is hilarious. At Regis? Yeah, you get yeah. a Regis lamp. A oh, lamp. Mm. I, I love to... lamp. <laughs> I don't know what All that right. means. It's from Anchorman. I know, but I never understood it. Did you see the movie? Yeah, but no, oh. I might have fallen asleep. Okay. No, Maybe I'll watch it again. Anyway. Yeah, so I think a ukulele would be better. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, totally. Matt, do you, do, you, do you guys, Matt or Al, do you have anything coming up for when you retire that you know of? Has anyone told you the secret retirement gift you'll be getting? I've been self-employed for 15 years. So, uh, you know, I think anything that any gift is the is, gift I'll put in quotes because be, I'll be giving it to myself and I haven't That's really right. identified what that would be. So retirement, even though I'm, even though I'm an older BCBA, I guess by statistical standards, I, I retirement still, uh, you know, a long way off from same where I am. So, so sad. I, mean, I, I got 30, just, 40 years before I retire. Yeah. So that's not really on my brain. Yeah. <laughs> You always want to keep right. it in the back. You never know. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm like lucky. A... I'm like thinking about what I'm going to make for dinner later. That's like right. my long term <laughs> forecasting, right? Yeah. So. I have a friend that just retired. He's like 41. Was and he like a tech billionaire or something? I don't remember what he is, but he does something. Not anymore. And I does nothing. Well, I wish I knew what that job was. But retirement at yeah. 41 sounds great. But then he's like, what do I do? Because everyone you live all the his rest of your working. life. Right. So he's like just bored. Oh, I wouldn't be. Oh, well, let's all I shed a tear. Wow. Wow. No yeah, no, so that that is the epitome of a first world problem. So, <laughs> oh, hey, boy. you know, one of the things we did with this year in review is uh, yeah. submitted some questions from the audience, and we got a, some late responses, but some really good questions from the the interwebs. You mean the World Wide Web, Matt? Yeah, yeah the, the www. Web. Dot internet. <laughs> dot com. It's www. Dot questions. <laughs> dot com. We said. I'll interject just real quick. I did check. This is the fifth year. No, thank, thank you, you oh, Alan. Thank you. Someone's paying attention. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. So, so we, we did we, it. You know, I, yeah. We have a, quite a few questions and they're all over the place. So mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm happy to take a stab at these. Oh, or, go, or go for it, man. Them. Yeah. How about I ask them and then we all can kind of chime in. So I'm going to start with a fun one. This is a topic near and dear to my heart. And it's from uh, Ryan O'Donnell of the Daily BA and other, uh, hey, other, other I guess, internet properties, if you will. <laughs> and he says, do you prefer New England style or West Coast style IPA? Or I think he's saying, what's the best? What's better? What's superior, the New England style or West Coast style IPA? And, you know, to me, to ask the question is to answer it, right? Mm-hmm. You know, so this really, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to uh, go out on the limb here and just say like, you know, we're, this is a pretty new, Alan, I don't know where you hail from, but the four of us here are, are in New England, based out of New England. <laughs> And so we're, I'm just going to say, I'm pretty biased. I think some of the best beers in the world are made in Maine and Vermont. And there's a couple of really great breweries in Massachusetts and New York and New Jersey. Mm-hmm. My home state of New Hampshire, you know, for some reason, we have a couple here and there, but the <laughs> density of, of great breweries is pretty, it's pretty dense in places like Portland, Maine mm-hmm. and, and other places like that. So I'm, I'm going to go East Coast uh, beers for sure. Although I will make an, you know, I will have to just editorialize here a little bit. I will say that West the West Coast pale ales of the of the nineties really I guess ushered into the era of craft beer of the craft beer renaissance, <laughs> if you will. The renaissance. Uh, yes, the <laughs> renaissance. And so I think if it wasn't for beers like Sierra Nevada Pale Ale, mm. you know, Stone, Firestone Walker, Anchor Steam, and so on and so forth. Those are Did kind you say of, Mac and Jack? Mac and Jack. Oh, Mac yeah. and Jack no, I, is yeah, an amazing you. West Coast beer. Yep, yep, yep. 
oh, I'm sure people on the West Coast are probably screaming at us right now. Yeah, they're they're like, like, you don't know what you're talking about. It's not that easy to get them here. And to be honest, it's like you've got so many that are like made in New England. It's like, well, I'm I'm probably going to pick those. We are assuming with this question that IPAs are good to start with. Yeah, I was gonna. Well, I was gonna answer. And I sour. would like to challenge that assumption. My answer is sour because I think they they are gross. <laughs> Outside the box with that answer. Yeah, my Alan, is all sours. That's a, I was, that's a that's a hot take if there ever was one. <laughs> I just as transplant to Wisconsin the last couple of years, I have to say, what's this East Coast West Coast stuff? <laughs> Wisconsin is supposed to be the home of good beer. Funnily enough, I don't really like beer that much of any kind. So, like, my what's the best beer? Like, let's go with some Belgian beers, like Belgian, mm. like fruit sours. Like mm. a Spencer's Trappist? No, no, like Lindman's, like their fruit oh, okay. sour beers All that right. are, yeah, where they throw in fresh fruit in the, the last stage of fermentation. I don't like beer otherwise, so I'm the wrong person to ask oh. and the wrong person to move to Wisconsin, the most alcoholic. I mean, the most alcohol appreciative state <laughs> in the union. <laughs> I wonder right, if they like right. fondue since that involves cheese and beer. Yeah, I mean, cheese, beer, and brats is like the mm. like the holy trinity here, from what <laughs> gotcha. I understand. So, okay. very cool, very cool. Well, Ryan, thanks for that fun question. He so also, the answer is sours. <laughs> I guess the answer was sours, <laughs> regardless regardless of where it's made. Right? It was a yeah. twist. It was a twist yeah. on the question. I see. I see. All right. So he also more seriously asked, uh, you know, what are some of the most downloaded topics of, pa- of the past few years on each respective podcast? And he's like, I'm not looking for authors per se, but more so topics. You know, what are some popular topics that that you guys have covered? So, well, what, what would you guys say in terms of your show in 2022? What were some What were some of the shows that were were well received amongst your audience? Well, Diana usually looks at that data, but as I asked her that question, she informed me. Well, I lost some of it when I transferred the files over, and I did not have time okay, to well, look just, on Libsyn. Just, just kind of yeah. go shoot from the hip here. What were some of the ones you got the most feedback from? I, or, I like, will you got say the that uh, engagement over. We talked about we did an episode on facilitated communication, and we did get you know we, a lot. Like we got a lot more emails than we usually do. I mean, again, they they were all related to the topic, but like we had someone email us. We we talked a lot about the prisoners of, of silence documentary mm-hmm. from the 90s and we actually had someone email us who said i was one of the facilitators i wasn't i was like part of that i wasn't in the documentary because you know there was like some job pressure to not sign the the release or whatever yeah. but actually was like perf- you know performing it had been a part of sort of the early investigation related to it so that was pretty cool and the conclusion of that it was you know yes not really- yes yes, okay. yes they felt they felt yeah. i mean they they they, they i mean we, we sort of hypothesized that, you know all people must have felt bad or a lot of people in the documentary seemed like they felt really bad about it and it was such a tragedy and yes this and and they said they still talk and, and share about facilitated communication and the harm and they're still shocked as anyone that it still just keeps keeps coming back and never dies so i know that one that one got a lot of responses i don't i don't know offhand if it was like most downloaded or anything like that right Right. well i can tell you historically our episode on toilet training continues to be a very popular one anything related to supervision is always popular because people are like and you know need to learn about that topic and then i think that episodes that we've done related to Services in schools and assessments seem to me to be areas that people are really looking for additional information on. So we have one on FBAs. We have one on the essentials for living. We have one on positive behavioral sports. We have the episode that you came on and did on school consulting. I, think I was going to say, we those have school are actually like the same guy. He showed up. I, yeah. <laughs> I think he works, he works independent. <laughs> I was going to say either retirement gift, either the supervision episode or our conversion theory episode must have done very well based on my communication with Diane recently about mm-hmm. CEU and everything yeah. because yes. that was a noticeable uptake in like sort of yeah well, a lot those were very this. popular yeah. yeah yeah that episode with Dr Sarah Campo and Dr uh, Matt Kemp- yeah, really. Campanetti or something like that. Yeah. Sorry if you're listening. Let me try. Can we try that again? <laughs> well, no, we got it. No, no. Yes, yes, yes. Get Nailed it. Nailed it. Capriati. Capriati, yeah. Ah, okay. Dr. Matt Capriati. Everyone who has given us any feedback on that was spoke highly of it. How about you, Matt? I had a couple that were noteworthy. And I guess I would say, you know, to answer, answer Ryan's question directly, you know, it's, it's the, the shows, I'm sure it's the same for you guys. They're always accumulating downloads. Right. So like something released in January 1st is going to have something that's going to have more downloads than yeah. 
you know, something that's released in November 1st, right? So, so I, I try to look at the first, I don't know, month or so of downloads. And I would say a couple different things. One is the trauma informed episode I did. It was an inside Java episode with uh, Deethan Rajaraman. Mm-hmm. So D2 came on. He's been on a couple of times and he's, you guys know him. He's just a, he's just yeah. a great guy <laughs> and guy. fun to talk to and is a, just an excellent science communicator. And so that was a really, really well received episode. Why Your Behavior Plan Stinks Meryl, by, with Meryl oh, Winston. Yeah. <laughs> that one was fun. Matt, you went to the Stone, Stone Soup, Soup yeah. right? I yeah. could have sworn I saw you. I saw because we, because, uh, but I, I, he did a similar. Yep. I, was it there? Was it, I saw it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it was, was a Stone, Stone Soup. Soup. Okay. I was going to say, I was like, that sounds so familiar. Yeah. That was, I thought that was very interesting. I yeah, have, I yeah. got his. So did you read his hilarious. book? The special, edu- his like adventures in special education. Have you read that? I, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't have it. No, uh, I don't either. I just put, I put it on my, on my wish list, but it was a little expensive. So I was like, I'll wait on that one. I got a whole stack that, you know, I keep buying and then, you know, have not gotten to. So, yeah, uh, but it's maybe I think someday. if I read the book, I would hear it in Merrill's voice. That's yeah. the, that, that'd be the funny, you know, but, but Mer- Merrill, I become f- friends through the podcast, you know, just, mm-hmm. for, and we, oh yeah, he's been on frequently. your show several times. Yeah. 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 We talk all the time in addition to that too. Nice. So it's, it, I think if I read anything, I'm sorry. I just saying besties. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, so anytime I read something he's written, I, I imagine it in his voice. It's kind of <laughs> kind of weird, but funny. I'm oh. Excited all the time, Matt, when you're talking. Yes, he's got 100%. like a Lewis, like a Lewis Black kind of sort of just like comedic. You timing see is what to you him. get. Okay, yeah, what you see is what you get. There's no there's no playing for the camera or microphone or whatever. That is Merrill twenty four seven. The preference for contingent reinforcement episode with uh, mm-hmm. Dr. Holly Gover that was very well received. Nice. We're replicating um, her study right now. Ooh. Yeah, she knows. <laughs> the secret. Her. Don't tell her. We told her. Nice. Oh, well, we'll have to. I can't wait to hear how that goes. And then the ethics and punishment episode I recently did with with uh, mm-hmm. our mutual many time guest, Matt Broadhead. Nice. So that, Sir that Matthew one, Broadhead. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So that one went over really well. And actually, I got a lot of emails from like people in academia saying, well, you know, uh, <laughs> it's like a lot of like, you know. Actually, right. <laughs> and there was, you know, because we were speaking so extemporaneously. And whenever you do that, you 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 run the risk of of making a slight error here and there. And so I actually have Tim Hackenberg coming on the show to oh. clean up some an error that I made when I was talking. Oh, about oh. oh nice. so, yeah. So that I'm looking forward to that. So that that that's gonna that's be great fun. and not you know, you know, at all. I mean, Matt, and, and you'll and you know, and, and Alan, you, you know this a little bit too, and I think we all know this. When you produce as much content as one has to produce to have a podcast that sort of develops a listenership, the odds that you're not going to say something that's kind of like a little off or a slight error or like, you know, was is easy to take out of context. It's zero because you just you never get to stop talking. That's like the new media thing. You're going to write a paper. You know, people will talk about it, but you spent years working on that paper and crafting yeah. every little bit. You don't quite yeah. get that same and, timeline and people, for podcasts. And people still make mistakes when they do that too, to mm-hmm. be, you know, per, yeah, but yeah, it's the law of large numbers. You know, you do, you know, you roll that dice a, a number of, you roll that yeah. die a number of times and, you know, it's going to, you know, come up not in your favor. So the, the good part about that is that we're going to get a chance to explore we're going to talk about token. I made it some just off the cuff comment about token economies, and so we're going to we're going to delve into that. And that, nice. which by the way, recall that episode that you guys did. I don't know if it was in 2022 or in 2021, but you guys 2021 did an episode. Jason Beret's token economy was so good. Oh mm-hmm. my gosh, that was! I think I texted you, Jackie. I was like, yeah, you did. We were texting after. I'm like, after. I'm like yes, awesome. mind blown. Yeah, this he is was, awesome. He's a really good guy. Yeah, that was in uh, 2021, but that uh, was real. That, yeah. was a- that was so good. That was so good. So yeah, so lots more to get into on token economy. So yeah. I'm, I'm looking forward to getting schooled a little bit on that. So yeah, yeah. my eyes were wide uh, so for those, days after. Th- mm, those were uh, those were four <laughs> shows that were that were I think particularly no noteworthy. Oh, I, now I'm going to go back and engagement. listen. Oh, sorry. Now I'm going to go back and listen to your and Matt Broadhead's episode <laughs> to see where you went wrong. Then I'll yeah, text you if yeah. I find it. Was it. Fu- it was a fun episode. Uh, and again, Matt's another one of those people that I've just gotten to know really well through the podcast. And we talk, you know, pretty frequently as well. And so it was one of those things. It was like, it was more conversational than like question, answer, question, yeah. answer. Yeah. yeah. So, you know. Uh, the other nice thing about podcast, so you're just going to get to do another one. So you're making a mistake. You right, right, you just you do go. the follow up, right? <laughs> <laughs> indeed, indeed. All right. Okay, we've got another question here. This one came in from Instagram from spec underscore educate. 
Evidence based on social stories. I think there are 16 or 17 reviews done by now. Pretty clear that social stories effectiveness is not there for various reasons. So why are they so why are they so prevalent as a strategy to support individuals with ASD? I want to answer this one. Okay. Go ahead. Because I've been thinking about it because I have so I'm doing some clinical work now. Sadly for me, because I don't really want to, but I'm doing it. And everyone loves social stories so much. I think for a variety of reasons. I think the first being is that they are very easy. Mm -hmm. Right. They are easy and that they lay the groundwork. And what the research suggests is that social stories alone are not effective, but social stories is part of a treatment package where you have some role play and feedback and modeling the prompting, skills you want, reinforcement. prompting, reinforcement, right? Then they can be effective as part of a treatment package, even though alone they are not effective, mm -hmm. right? They're probably just the instruction paper if you're doing like a BST, yeah, right? But people love social stories. Because, it's a checklist, but it's beautiful to look at. Yeah, but I think, you know, I've, I I mean, almost all the kids that I consult with right now have some sort of social story. And I didn't put them in there, but they're there. And, you know, when I talk about removing them because they don't have effectiveness by themselves, like parents get upset. They get, they have like an unnatural love for social stories, I think, because it's something that they can do at home that's easy, that yeah. they can practice. And they're like, we all Response need to Response efforts know, low, social right? validity Response is high. Response efforts low. And so I think it's really about making sure that those social stories are part of a bigger treatment package and not just being like, I'm going to fix this problem by throwing a social story at yeah. them. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And my, my, my take on that is that, you know, the things that are doing the heavy lifting probably are the... The Everything rehearsal, else. the role play, the right. deck, et cetera. Yeah. But yeah. So I think that's a great, <laughs> that's a great explanation. So and thank you, spec underscore educate mm -hmm. for sending that yeah. story in. Thank you. Going back to, to Matt Broadhead. Oh, sorry, Alan. Uh, but going no, back to Matt Broadhead, I, I feel like in the chain of working with others, social stories is in that part where it's like, do you really need to get up and scream about there's not an evidence base for this? Or can you just sort of turn into the skid and be like social story? That's a great step one. And then here are all the other things we should also be doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're not militantly opposed to them, which is no. part of our... I love a good story. I feel you like it's part of our issue in our field is that then we come down so hard on something like that. Yeah. Alan, what were you going to say? Well, I was going to say, having done at some autism conference, actually met Carol Gray and did her like little fidelity checklist on what a, a good social story is. A lot of it just comes down to think, incorporates things that we say, like have state what the expected behavior is rather than saying like, oh, you shouldn't do this and you shouldn't do this. Like don't incorporate shame-based tactics, yeah. which if you look at so many social stories, that that's far mm -hmm. too common. But when they're executed right, I think it's more that they give the adults the language <laughs> rather than like helping the kid of just like, oh, you know, we have you oh. know, telling mm -hmm. people what to expect. I mean, that, that's how I've always sort of felt about using them. So that, that brings up a good point, Alan, because, yeah. because one of the things I do see, so if I, the learner has to have the language skills to appreciate the elements of the story, right? The, uh, you know, the, the, the sequence of events, the, the role of the contingencies. So what I see from time to time is people using social stories with individuals who aren't even close to having the language skills to be able to appreciate the social, the, the, whatever the content of the social stories. And you might be better off using things like task analyses and, yeah. you know, that, or other sort of, you know, chaining, shaping, blah, 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 you know, all, all the, the kind of, uh, the kind of boring old stuff that we know that, 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 act, you know, that works. <laughs> so that's, I don't know. But True. That's, that's my take yeah. on that. You know, so if, yeah. it, if it's being used with a learner who has the language skills and that, you know, to, to follow along, and then you can couple that with, the things that actually do the heavy lifting in terms of behavior change, it's great. But yeah, you know, it's it, I, I just kind of cringe a little bit when I see it used with people who who don't have the, the either the cognitive or the language skills to, to to grasp the content of the story. Yeah. Okay. Great question. We have time for yeah. one more. I think. Yeah. We have time. All right, man. Oh. You want to read? I, I, you put another one in the notes. A re yeah, a, a reflection one. Ooh, this one's this one's big. This could be a whole podcast unto itself. Yeah. <laughs> All right. This is from Penny Holloway. Thank you, Penny, for writing this in. It's a it's a big question, and and again, we could have spent the entire time doing just going all, over this. All right. Here it goes. I've been reflecting upon the following: Is our field shifting? Is it changing? Are we moving towards compassionate care? Are we listening to autistics more? 
Are we moving towards trauma-assumed care, away from certain punishments, for example, electric shock, towards socially valid goals? What would be the measurement for that? It feels like the field is shifting, but is it? I've been reflecting upon what would be the measurement for that. So, excellent mm. question. So, yeah. Yeah. I think it's a good one, a good one too for all of us because kind of, you know, I think we usually end these with a sort of like, what's, you know, what's coming up in the year? Like, what's next for the field? So, I think this one kind of captures that idea of, all right, all these things that we've talked about in previous years, we've talked about on our shows the this past year, I think will probably be topics we continue to talk about into the new year that really play into some of the fears that I think we as behavior analysts have. Not so much because any of those are things we should be scared of, but because how, yeah, how do we know that we're doing it enough that the average person doesn't say, oh, behavior analysis, the conversion therapy folks, isn't that what they do now? Or did they, this like weird misperception that seems to have become more and more prevalent in, in 2022. I mean, it, it had been before, but it just seems like it's in more places than it, than I, I can remember, even as someone who's not like actively on, you know, that many, many social media sites. Good for you. Yeah. <laughs> That's some that's some solid self care advice right there. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> I spent too much time. <laughs> uh, well, stuff. One of us has to be. Before we run out of time, this is also a great question because it rolls in some questions that we we got from listener Megan. So I just want to make sure I note that because I wanted to. I told her we would cover her questions too, and they were: What are the biggest controversies facing our field? What makes you nervous and excited about the future of behavior analysis? Right. So all of this kind of gets wrapped up in. Penny's and Megan's questions together. So, but Penny's asking two different things. One of which is, do we feel like there might be a shift, right? And how can, as a good behaviorist does, how can you actually measure, right? <laughs> Whether there is that shift. So mm -hmm. I think if you spend a lot of time on social media, then you do feel like that they, there is a shift because the conversations that are happening on those platforms are generally more progressive are talking about, you know, trauma informed practices are bringing in a lot of discussions related to compassionate care, cultural responsiveness, listening to autistic voices. And I think that that's all great, but it's, it is a self selecting subset of the behavior analytic population that represents themselves on social media in that way. So attempting to determine the direction that the field at large is moving is probably more difficult. And to me, it always comes back to what the newest behavior analysts are being taught in their programs. So are these issues being covered in their programs? How are they? Are they being tackled at all? How are they being represented? And what are those new folks' views on the appropriateness of all those things I just mentioned going to be so that as they go out into the field, are they than producing behavior change on their own. And that any of those types of changes are going to take time. And we may not really fully see the effects for a long time. And and I like to think about it as when you look at those bigger ABA companies, are they making those shifts? Mm -hmm. Right? Because smaller behavior analytic companies, you know, they might have an easier time to make those types of shifts. But are the bigger companies that are like, we're the best in the world, are they now taking into consideration trauma-informed care, compassionate care, cultural responsiveness, and are they making yeah. changes in their agencies? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I do some consulting for some bigger agencies in some places. I do see them starting to have, starting, right, to have these conversations, whereas in other companies, I, I have not seen a change mm -hmm. at all. So... Yeah. I don't know. And, they, and education doesn't stop after you get out of grad right. school, right? Yeah. So the culture of the place where you choose to work has a huge impact on how you develop as a behavior analyst as well. Okay. So as some, I've thought about this because that was the question that I thought that maybe I, as the clinician in the field, could think I'm a lot clinician about. I'm too, now too, Alan. <laughs> yes, it's true. It's true. I'm not discounting other people. Just saying. Out there. I think that what I've noticed over the year my last year as I've practiced fully as a licensed behavior analyst in sort of the clinical setting, my education, which I, I graduated from my program in the end of 2019. So it's been a couple of years now. It just took me a while to get my field work done. 
which is a whole nother ethical thing that we can talk about how we can do that better for new behavior analysts. I would say that there is a distinct difference in what I learned and what people who have been behavior analysts for more than five years have learned in terms mm. of extinction and mm -hmm. DRI and DRA and things like that. And that it's, it's interesting, even just training like RBTs, it's a different approach and incorporating more like developmental not developmental psychology knowledge and like this is how we deal with all children and children of all types benefit from caring nurturing attentive adults that was definitely something i felt i got a big dose of in school and working in schools i think what we've done is draw a really good line about what's not acceptable mm -hmm. but we haven't yet gotten to a point where we're have clearly defined what's only acceptable. And we're all practicing in this gray area between, well, we're not unacceptable and that no, not enough people <sighs> protest about what we're doing, but do we have a good delineation of like these practices remain and will continue to remain acceptable in our field. And we won't do anything that's, mm that's less acceptable than these. And I feel we're, we're definitely in that gray area of growth as a field. Yeah. I'm trying to think how to answer this question and I'm looking at the clock here. We have six minutes left before we have to <laughs> close the, the, the lid, put the lid on this one. And I've got a lot of different thoughts. You know, I, there's so many things I wanted to get into with this question, but I, I think what I would say is I, what I, I guess I'll just try to pick one aspect of this. With regard to, you know, some of the controversies as it relates to like the JRC and CESS and things like that, I just want to put a thought out there. One of the things that I don't, I think was missed in a lot of these discussions over this is the lack of truly getting our arms around the prevalence of individuals who exhibit life-threatening, severe, dangerous behavior. We don't know what that number is at all. And I'm not talking the, about the JRC in particular. I'm talking about of all the individuals out there who have severe dis behavioral disabilities to the extent to which they are putting their lives or other people's lives in jeopardy vis-a-vis -vis their problem behavior. There's an interesting article in Disability Scoop that I'll send to you guys for the, for the show notes about the number of... It was a, written by a local journalist in the Minneapolis area. And the, you know, the, the, the gist of the article is that there is a ton of kids in the Minneapolis area, and this could be replicated all across the country, perhaps all across the world, who, are, who have severe behavior disorders and they're languishing in, in hospitals right now, not getting access to state-of-the-art behavior analytic treatment. There's being subjected to physical restraint, probably many times mechanical restraint in terms of posy cuffs and probably uh, most certainly chemical restraint of one variety or yeah. another. And we don't have the foggiest idea of how many people are out there. And if we think of, if you think of all the energy expended on the, on, you know, looking at, looking at one facility, you know, I, I really wish, you know, I really wish we could also turn our attention or at least broaden our perspective. I'm not saying the JRC stuff is unimportant. Okay. Don't get me wrong. But there are people, there are so many more, there are, there are untold many, many, many times number of people out there who, whose quality of lives are horrendous because they have this repertoire of problem behavior that's going unaddressed. And I think that is really where the ABAIs and the APBAs and you know, uh, all our other you know, kind of organizations should really direct their efforts towards. You know, what, we should have a... a you know, kind of almost like, I don't know. I don't know like what the right force? word for it is. <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking more like, you know, like a, like a, like a moonshot or Marshall plan, if you will. <laughs> like I'm talking like a big <laughs> effort, and a big endeavor to figure out how many people are out there who need these services and what we can do. And if there is something like that ongoing, and I'm just, you know, blissfully ignorant here in my little travels of, in uh, Northern New England, please let me know because I want to, mm. I want to learn more about it for sure. But as far as I understand, as far as I can tell, I'm, I'm not seeing any, there's not really a discussion of that. It's just, mm. you know, shock, shock is bad. Everyone should go to the, to Kennedy Krieger instead. You know, <laughs> like <laughs> I'm just, I'm being a little facetious here for the, and, and again, we don't have time to really get into the, the nitty gritty of this, but I, I would just like to leave that as a, as a, as a, uh, leave people with that thought. What can we learn 
about the number of people out there who, whose quality of lives are completely compromised because they don't have access to the treatment that we know will make their lives better. That's well. Yeah, that's well. That's well said, Matt. I I I agree that, that it is very easy to get involved in very passionate arguments, and then sometimes that does lead to, you know, forgetting that there are, there are lots of passionate arguments. There are lots of needs, and it often goes beyond just kind of very molecular questions. But we've got 2023 coming up, so we'll have plenty of time to. <laughs> discuss you know maybe maybe we'll, maybe we'll need to do a mid-year given given these great questions people are sending in. We'll yeah, end great. Year, yeah, know, start a year i don't know we can always do more uh, yeah, <laughs> more talking good. about these issues as one of, one of the positives of our field there's so much more still to learn even after all these years well everyone i know we only had a short time short time this year but it was great getting a chance to sort of kind of wrap up and sum up and look back at the year with everybody here so if folks if you for some reason this was the first behavioral observations episode or aba inside track episode you've heard guess what there's like hundreds more of these you <laughs> you're, can you're listen in luck. To, you are in yeah, luck. Yeah, it's our it's our end of your gift to you the <laughs> listener hundreds of hours of conversations with us with you, sometimes with with all of us, sometimes with other guests, sometimes just with certain groups. But yes, we've got lots lots out there about behavior analysis, and we're going to keep learning into 2023. Anyone have plans that that's enough behavior analysis? It's ukulele time. I think we're all still, got, still got more in the tank. Not this, year. Not this year. Okay. All right. All right, well, guys. It's good. Another 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 fun year in review episode. Thanks so much. Oh, thank you, Matt, and thanks, Alan, for getting to join in this year. We're very happy to have you. Yeah, Did thanks you, for inviting me. The youth perspective from from Al. <laughs> We're in trouble if I'm the youth perspective. <laughs> All, right, All right, guys. Thank you Happy so much. New Happy New Year. All right. See you guys. Bye. 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 Bye.